morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. One of the things we've discussed before here on the show is how difficult it is for foreign actors to fully transition into the Hollywood marketplace, outside, of course, of uh, talent from the UK and Australia. But from any other country, uh, it's very difficult for them to stick around. Of course, they can make a splash, like, say, uh, Roberto Benigni, or before him, Catherine Deneuve. I mean, we're talking about actors that are recognized by Hollywood uh, through the Oscars and such, uh, and the media. And I'm sure that moviegoers, American moviegoers, could pick them out of a crowd, or at least when they hear their name, it sounds familiar. But I'm talking about a full transition where they become uh, a box office star and a draw in their own right. Uh, very unusual and almost never happens. I think the person enjoying the most success right now is Christoph Waltz, but that's largely due to Quentin Tarantino. And Marion Cotillard is uh, pretty well known, but again, that's thanks to another director, Christopher Nolan. Uh, although, for instance, take Jean Dujardin. Whatever happened to Jean Dujardin? He had very small roles in The Wolf of Wall Street and Monuments Men, but he really has nothing else on the, on the horizon stateside, and he seems to have largely just gone back to France. Uh, so that's why it's very interesting to see one of his uh, fellow countrymen, Omar C., uh, see if he can make the transition. And he's going about it in a very different manner, uh, which I think might actually work for him. So uh, that's what I want to discuss this morning as the first story. Uh, Omar C., of course, some of you are already familiar with him, or at least know who he is visually, because you've seen him in the trailers for X-Men Days of Future Past. He is playing Bishop. Now, of course, this is a very small role, almost a cameo. And as we've uh, said also, it's almost just to promote X-Men Days of Future Past past in Europe, to have Omar C be able to do the publicity. Now, of course, Omar C is already a huge star in France, one of their biggest stars, actually, thanks to The Untouchables. That was a, one of the most successful films ever to come out of France and in Europe. Huge grocer, did very little box office stateside, though. Uh, the Weinstein Company, I think, released it here, but they also had the rights to remake it as an English language film, which, again, as we've also been discussing, is something, you know, kind of an underhanded technique in Hollywood that they, they will release these foreign films stateside, but they put very little... Um, money into promoting them and getting the word out because just for instance also with the raid and the raid 2 because they want to eventually make it an English language remake and they want that to be the first introduction to the story for most movie going audiences so the untouchables was largely buried here in the states but it was a huge hit everywhere else and also although it is being shown I think in foreign language classes one of you recently just uh, mentioned when I was talking about Omar C that you'd seen The Untouchables, I think, in your French class and you thought it was a very good film. And, he, you know, Omar C actually won the César Award for Best Actor for his performance there, and he was the first black actor to ever win that award in France. So that speaks a little bit to what's going on with France racially, and that movie brought that up to some degree, but that's a whole other discussion. But anyway... Omar C. now, of course, is in a great position to move into the United States box office. We were there, there's a lot of money at play. He's already a huge star in France, but that's a big impetus for coming over here. A lot of talent, a lot of great opportunities, huge paychecks. And you can become a global star. Although I guess you could argue he, to some degree, is a global star off of The Untouchables because that was such a huge hit all over the world except for the United States. But he's going to see if he can uh, really make it big here in America, and I guess to some degree China as well, the two biggest movie-going audiences in the world. So he has this small role in X-Men Days of Future Past, an action movie as Bishop, a, a fan favorite character, so that's great that he got that role. But then also he has a very big role in Jurassic World, which I'm very happy to hear. I don't like it when Hollywood takes foreign actors and just gives them these small throwaway roles. I think they should really invest in them. Uh, and it's great to see uh, the, uh, the director of uh, Jurassic World, he's uh, Colin Trevorrow, uh, talking about uh, details for the film. This is a slight spoiler. If you hate spoilers of any kind, uh, you might want to skip ahead a little bit uh, or to the next story. Uh, but anyway, apparently Omar C. isn't going to die in Jurassic World because uh, uh, Colin Trevorrow says he's working very hard to build up the friendship between Omar C. and Chris Pratt for something they can carry over to multiple films. Uh, kind of almost a buddy element. And I think that's great. It'll be, I mean, Omar C., of course, was uh, he was the funny one, though, in The Untouchables, and Chris Pratt is usually the funny one in his movie, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of dynamic they have together. Uh, but they apparently work together in Jurassic World, so I think that's interesting. You know, there's been a lot of speculation that Jurassic World will focus on the theme park one it is finally opened it's actually fully operational uh, so that'll be very interesting it really really will be a, a Disney World with dinosaurs kind of uh, scenario that was teased in the first film uh, and so I think that's a great idea by the way but so to see Omar C have a fully realized role I think will be very exciting and so I'm very curious to see how that works out uh, and how he and Chris Pratt play off each other but to have these two big action movies X-Men Days of Future Past and Jurassic World that is really a great way to introduce yourself to the American audience American audiences love we love 
of our blockbusters, uh, because we, you know, of the economy and certain factors which we've been discussing here, the rise of television, etc., uh, quality in television, the, the the, the drop in the quality of the movie-going experience, the economy, uh, mov moviegoers often will only pay to see a blockbuster in theaters. So this is a great way for Omar seeing a great property to really kind of um, uh, make uh, introduce himself to American audiences in a very positive and fun manner. Uh, but he does have a, a highbrow film that he's going to be involved in called Candy Store. Uh, it's from uh, Stephen Gagan. Uh, he wrote Traffic was for Steven Soderbergh, and he wrote and directed Syriana uh, with George Clooney. And this is a, a more serious film. It's about an undercover policeman trying to be uh, just a regular beat cop after you know to make that transition. But his life as an undercover uh, police officer follows him to his new gig. I'm not quite sure who's playing the police officer, what the role breakdown is, but it will co-star Robert De Niro uh, and Kira Knightley. Now, neither one of those uh, has a great track record, but I think Stephen Gagan's involvement uh, can show that it at least is trying to be highbrow. And that's usually the route that most foreign actors would take, especially after an, uh, uh, an award-winning film like The Untouchables. They would try and go into the specialty market here in the United States. Uh, but it's great, it's very interesting to see Omar C maybe, uh, you know, going the, you know, uh, Harrison Ford, Will Smith route of trying to get some really great franchises under his belt. So we'll see. I mean, look at Daniel Radcliffe. He went kind of the backwards route. You know, not intentionally. He was a child cast in Harry Potter. But you see him making very interesting career choices now that he has the celebrity and the, um, the financial situation that was presented to him because of the Harry Potter movies, and it allows him now to do whatever he wants. So I'm curious, are those of you who are already fans and familiar with Omar C's work, do you like the uh, strategy he's employing here? Do you think Jurassic World is a good choice for him in X-Men Days of Future Past? Uh, and also, anyone who is not familiar with his work, are you intrigued? Are you intrigued to see this uh, French movie star, see if he can make it over here in the States? And do you feel bad that Jean Dujardin didn't stick around? Uh, why do you think it's so difficult for these other actors to make that transition. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, somebody who's having a very hard time transitioning into uh, Hollywood, even though she started out here, is Lupita Nyong'o. And it's interesting that a lot of people talk about um, the, the color of her skin being a problem, that, oh, a dark-skinned uh, 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 you know, black actress in Hollywood is going to have a much harder time than a lighter-skinned one. Although Omar C is also dark-skinned and no one's making an issue about that. So it's interesting to see and unfortunate to see um, that dual, dual standard. But Lupita Nyong'o, a big story from last week, is that she finally signed on with a, uh, a representation, an agency. She signed over at CAA. Uh, she, had, she had been waiting to sign on until after she won an Oscar, hopefully. She, that was quite the gamble. She had no representation. Uh, a lot of people obviously wanted to sign her after 12 Years a Slave started to make the festival rounds. Uh, but she held out. Uh, and uh, she, it, was a, it was a gamble, as I said, but it paid off. And she actually uh, has been uh, signed with Hilda Queeley, uh, one of the top agents at CAA. She represents uh, Jessica Chastain, Marion Cotillard, who we were just talking about, Kate Blanchett, Kate Winslet, uh, Berenice Vejo, another f uh, French actress uh, who has not been able to transition stateside, despite uh, a lot of high profile in the artist. Although high profile in the media and the award circuit, although the artist was a very low grossing film here in the States, and Numi Rapace. So, uh, and also another, another foreign actress who's had a very hard time transitioning, uh, despite, and she tried to go the franchise route now that, you, now that I think about it with, uh, for instance, Sherlock Holmes, but she is not really catching on either. Uh, this is an interesting group of actresses. I don't know if it'll help Lupita Nyong'o. You'll notice that none of them really is in big budget successful films. They're all, um, you know, highbrow actresses who have a, a lot of awards to their names, uh, but not a lot of, uh, you know, number one debuts. So I'm not sure how this will work for Lupita Nyong'o. I know she's trying to break out a little bit. She had a much more fresh, fun image that she debuted at the MTV Movie Awards, which I thought was to her credit. Uh, now, she did meet with J.J. Abrams, but I think that Obviously, I don't think that deal worked out because they're very close to announcing the cast for that. Uh, and Lupita was just announced that she's in the running to do a voiceover in the Jungle Book uh, alongside maybe Scarlett Johansson, and Idris Elba has already signed on there as well. I think it's a real shame that Lupita Nyong'o uh, won the Best Supporting Actress Oscar, and the biggest thing that she has on the horizon, the only real deal she's about to sign, is a voiceover role. I think it really speaks to the lack of opportunities for um, actors, actress, actors uh, particularly actresses, though, of color in Hollywood. But we'll see if she's able to find something. Some of us have been discussing the fact that she'd make a good storm. I think that's true. I think uh, a franchise would be a nice thing for her to have. But I think she really just needs to break out of, you know, she played uh, a very well, obviously she won an Oscar, but I think she needs to play a, a role that's race blind. 
uh, for her next role. I think she doesn't want to get shoehorned into only playing these very racially charged roles. Uh, you know, but Viola Davis, Angela Bassett are very good actresses who have not really been able to find anything in Hollywood. Uh, or, I mean, they're well known, but they haven't been able to forge really, you know, careers at the same level as white actresses. So we'll see what happens to Lupita Nyong'o, but this is uh, an encouraging step forward, and hopefully uh, there are good things on the horizon for her. We'll see what happens. So that's the second story of the day. The third is that, of course, we just talked last week uh, about the success of religious films in Hollywood, Heaven is for Real, still doing very strong. Noah, early on. Oscar contender maybe even, despite being very controversial, uh, son of God, uh, God's not dead, th there is a real uh, trend emerging here for religious films. Now Ben-Hur is something that Paramount is readying, a remake of the Charlton Heston film. On its own though, the Charlton Heston film is one of the most successful in, uh, uh, overall, critically, financially, etc., films of all time in Hollywood, especially when you account account for inflation. Although Hollywood doesn't chalk up, doesn't go to the inflation chart, so we can't either. But still, huge success. Very well re uh, respected and uh, regarded film. But the Paramount's going to remake it, and it seems that they're going to be really playing up the religious aspects of the movie. Of course, they were there in the original film with Charlton Heston, but I think they're going to really underline them here. This is a, just like the original Ben-Hur film. It's based on the 1880 novel by Lou Wallace called uh, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. And basically, it uh, tells the story of a, a noble, nobleman, a, I believe a Roman nobleman, falsely accused uh, by his best friend. Uh, there's like a, a, mis a misunderstanding, and his friend exacts revenge. And this nobleman ends up being a slave, and he manages to survive through very harrowing times. Uh, of course, there's the famous chariot race sequence in Ben-Hur. Uh, but then when he has a chance to confront this best friend who, who put, cast him into slavery uh, in a wrongly. Uh, he has to choose between retribution and forgiveness. And I, in the end, he witnesses the, um, the crucifixion of Christ. And it does have religious aspects even in this original version, but I think they're really going to play them up here. Uh, so obviously Noah has been very controversial, and Paramount wants to avoid that with Ben-Hur. And I think they probably took a look at what they had coming together here. This is going to be released in 2016, and they were like, well, we have Tamar Bek Membatov directing here, very successful, famous Russian director. Of course, he did Wanted, uh, the Angelina Jolie, James McAvoy uh, adaptation of the Mark Miller comic. Uh, but not exactly someone who has a, a deft, subtle touch. So they were, I think they were very concerned about uh, turning people off and not wanting, you know, this is going to obviously be an expensive film. They want to make sure it has the best chance to do well at the box office. So in addition to having John Ridley, who just won the Oscar for Best Screenplay for 12 Years a Slave, come in there, and of course he has experience with stories of slavery, to do a rewrite on the script, uh, they also just recently brought on Mark Burnett, of course the uh, Survivor reality television producer for The Apprentice as well, and Mark Burnett's wife, Roma Downey, who's also the actress. Um, and they're br they brought them on because Mark Burnett and Roma Downey have really become kind of um, a brand in the religious uh, filmmaking marketplace. They, of course, were behind the Bible miniseries on the History Channel, uh, and also they handled uh, the Son of God movie that recently came out, which was uh, several of the scenes from that miniseries and also some things that had been left out put back in. So I think that Mark Burnett and Roma Downey have worked hard to build a real following uh, and credibility in this uh, sector, and Paramount is looking to capitalize on that. So it's very interesting to see, um, you know, before these religious films have seemed a little niche with Heaven is uh, for Real, God God's not dead, uh, but then you know Noah. I think was a step into the more mainstream, and then you see this film, uh, Ben Hur, being brought into the mainstream, and uh, you know the producers taking the religious aspects very seriously. So I'm curious for those of you who enjoy these religious movies, uh, are you encouraged by this? Do you agree that Mark Burnett and Roma Downey are people that you trust when it comes to respectfully handle the religious aspects of a film? And for those of you who aren't as into religious films, uh, you know, and familiar are familiar with the original Ben Hur, do you want to see the religious aspects of the story um, built up or do you you know do you worry what that will do to the film uh, or, or the balance I, I just think it's a very interesting situation I really liked Noah I ended up I was surprised by how good it was and what Darren Aronofsky was able to achieve and I liked it though because I thought it was very forward-thinking in the way we view religion and have religion in our lives and uh, how we're open to it and it was almost I felt an evolution of you know um, a, mo a modern day relationship with religion. But some of this feels a little old school to me, uh, and I think there's a struggle even there. 
uh, and because some people were very offended by Noah. So this is a very touchy situation, obviously. Uh, faith is very personal, and so Hollywood, I guess, realizes how touchy and difficult this is, uh, and so we'll see what happens with Ben-Hur. But it'll be very interesting, and this is certainly a new phase in the career of Mark Burnett and Roma Downey to move from reality TV to really being a brand uh, for religious films. And do you think they're putting that brand to good use? Uh, that's a very big responsibility to take on. It isn't just a business decision uh, when you decide to speak for uh, religion when it comes to film. All right, so that's the third story of the day. The viewer question comes from Dariel Fuentes. He says, hi, Grace. I had to pick this because the person said first time commenter here and kind of proud of it, actually. I'm so glad, glad Daryl, that you decided to comment on the, uh, on the show finally uh, and you're excited about it. And so Daryl says, I just wanted to get your thoughts on what you think they're going to do about The Flash. I mean, he's one of the first members of the league. Uh, I enjoy watching Smiley Face. Good question. You know, we just talked on Friday about Cyborg being cast, but I'd be very surprised if The Flash were to show up um, in the movie because uh, Warner Brothers is working so hard to establish him as a television property. Uh, of course, the show on the CW, uh, they've already had that actor guest star on Arrow. Uh, I think they're probably going to maybe try and make a, a whole night of television out of this, basically. And they're very aggressively going after uh, an, a Flash television show. And based on the cult success of Arrow, uh, I can see why they're uh, pursuing that. But I don't see how you can have the character coexist at the same time as the movies. I mean, uh, even uh, the Arrow uh, cast has said they would like to see themselves maybe move up to the movies. I think Stephen Amel is the name of the actor. He said, I would, I would be honored to be in the movies. But I think that Warner Brothers has a tricky enough situation as it is getting their Justice League movie off the ground. I don't think they're going to want to... Um, you know, uh, trying to have to balance television as well. I mean, they are going, they are kind of uh, having a tricky situation with the Gotham TV series as well, but that's a prequel almost to the Batman uh, Ben Affleck universe they're going to be introducing on the big screen. But uh, as to your question, Dariel, I think The Flash is going to be benched on this one uh, or running on the TV treadmill. I don't think he's going to jump over to film. And also, the cast just seems very crowded at this point, as so many people are saying. I think they're really going to focus on Cyborg. Uh, maybe, I also think Green Lantern probably won't show up. Uh, I think there's a bigger chance that you'll have Aquaman uh, join, or maybe Shazam, uh, because I just feel that Green Lantern has a very bad background with the Ryan Reynolds situation. I think they're just going to be very careful. And they want to focus on maybe bringing some new characters, because that works so well for Marvel. Marvel, uh, you know, had already sold off their properties, and uh, the, the big name ones that I think the mainstream are more familiar with, which we discussed uh, recently as well. Uh, so they really were able to do a lot with, you know, secondary, or at the time, secondary characters. And I think DC is going to see if they can do the same uh, and kind of start fresh to some degree, which they really need to do. So um, when it comes to continuity, though, uh, while Marvel has really benefited from adhering to continuity, I think it's pretty clear that DC is reinventing the wheel when it comes to their film properties. And I think we just have to accept that. I mean, look at the huge changes made to Superman. So I think we're all going to be a lot less frustrated if we just let go of that. It's almost kind of like what you have to do with the X-Men movies. Although the X-Men movies have no continuity consistently even within their cinematic universe, which makes that very frustrating. So if DC can just create something in the cinematic universe that is at least um, by the books there, I think they'll be ahead of the game or at least on their way. But no Flash. Even though I do agree with you on the very cover of the very first Justice League issue, I think the Flash is there playing like chess or something, uh, but he will not be there uh, this time around. So what do you guys think? Do you, uh, do you like that DC is, you know, that David Goyer is playing around with a continuity and creating something fresh and new? Some people really think that they finally like Superman after the changes made in Man of Steel. While others like myself, well, a part of me as a Superman fan uh, feels that it's not Superman, but I, I, as I said, I think there's some really interesting things that were introduced there, and I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So uh, I would cherry pick some of the interesting elements uh, that were introduced. So that's my that's morning movie news. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll write down what you think of today's three top stories, the viewer question, and anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.